All right, why don't we kick it off? We've got uh, quite a few people in the meeting and others will still make it, but for the introduction, um, because we're behind already. So apologies for that and for the multiple Zoom links. Um, I'm David Albert from Johns Hopkins and the MARTA Governing Council, and I'm here to just sort of kick off MARTA 2024. We've got a great theme and a great bunch of sessions on foundations to futures, materials, data, and AI. Um, I want to mention two quick things. Introduction to MARTA, because we're growing, so we always have people who are here for the first time. Um, and really, I want to highlight just the essence of the MARTA mission, which is quite simple. We're here to connect and integrate materials research data infrastructure, and MARTA does it by promoting the convergence of ideas, people, data, and tools. So MARTA is a grassroots organization with governance by an elected council then that promotes the interests of the U.S. and international materials data researchers and coordinates the efforts of MARTA. So um, I think it's worth highlighting that MARTA responds to the MGI priority of building an innovative infrastructure and the needs to connect that infrastructure with a network. And that's really what we're trying to do. Second, MARTA is growing, but um, we always have the need for members to help it grow really, right? We have over 360 people registered for this week's meeting, which is fantastic. Um, but it needs to continue to grow and work to build the network, not just people who show up at a meeting, right? MARTA is about trying to do things, not just talk about things. We're really grateful um, to have an annual meeting like this to get people together and fire up some new ideas and have a broader discussion, but there's never enough time in a few half days to make enough of that discussion. So we're looking for ways to grow interaction um, outside of the meeting and on a more regular basis. We're particularly grateful to NIST for funding a MARTA's communication arm and the important projects that keep MARTA working every day. And we're really grateful to the National Science Foundation, who's been providing funder, funding for a fair and open science research coordination network, what we call Martian, which is really the central structure for several MARTA projects on metadata, fair ML models, and workforce training, all things that you'll hear about um, in working groups and other things this week. I want to call out, especially the 12 members of the MARTA Council, Selena's already sharing a um, uh, slide on the screen, so I won't put up the pictures of the council members, but you'll find them all on the website under Governing Council. These are people who meet every month and give up their time really to make a lot of the administrative stuff happen. Um, this year, four members of the council are gonna rotate off and they'll be replaced by elected, elected councilors. Um, many of you know, we had a full membership vote on uh, new members of the council over the last month and a half or so, and we'll introduce that, them and make that change on Thursday. I also want to call out a few people who've been instrumental in making this meeting happen. You'll hear from Deborah Audis of NIST, Corey Ostis from Johns Hopkins, and Fatih Sen of Novellus Aluminum in the sessions this week. But they also served as annual meeting chairs, and they deserve special recognition for that. That means that they met almost every week for six months planning and making this meeting happen. Their insight and the hard work are going to be dis on display really in every session. So we owe them a huge thanks. Olga Wodo of the MARTA Council has also met almost every week with the chairs and brought her experience and insight to help guide the meeting chairs and then pick up any tasks that needed extra attention. So thank you to Olga for her incredible effort as well. And then finally, I wanna thank uh, Selena Fitzgerald, the MARTA communications specialist and the staff of student workers she's recruited and worked with Jaco Shaza, Ethan uh, Verdusco, Juan Carlos and Kat. They have all interacted with poster participants, built the poster session web presence, overseen the judging of poster awards. Um, they've all been terrific. And Selena has been absolutely wonderful in managing all those shifting needs and the challenges that come with a big meeting like this. So now that we seem to have slowed down uh, the entry of people into the meeting, I'm gonna make a quick disclaimer. The meeting is being recorded. So that means by participating in the public discussion parts, you agree to have your participation recorded and perhaps posted on the web later. If you don't wish to do that, then please only participate through the shared Google Docs. There are shared Google Docs for every session where we keep track of things. So without further ado, if you're ready, Debbie, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to you and you can get us started with our first session not too far behind schedule already. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um for welcoming us all to MARTA 2024. Um, in line with the meeting's theme, today we'll be focusing on enabling the future through open materials, data, and AI. And to kick off this session, we're going to start with Dr. Benjamin Brown. Um, so I'm going to introduce him in a couple seconds, um, and I welcome him to uh, share his 
slides as I'm doing that introduction. Dr. Benjamin Brown is the director of the Facilities Division of the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program at the DOE Office of Science, a $650 million enterprise spanning Oak Ridge and Argonne Leadership Computing Facilities. The NERSEC User Facility at Berkeley Lab, the ESNet High Performance Network User Facility, and the announced High Performance Data Facility Project. Dr. Brown has led the strategic planning and the implementation of DOE's integrated research infrastructure activities. He is a member of the Senior Executive Service and holds a bachelor's degree in physics from Harvard and a doctoral degree in optics from the University of Rochester. His research career focused on control and manipulation of quantum atomic systems using precision optical techniques. And with that, I will let him take it away. Thank you very much. That's really kind of you, Debbie, and thank you to you and other organizers, and thank you for this opportunity to be with Marta. I'm going to be uh, lightning speed here to get through a few slides as a kind of appetizer for the discussion to come, because that's what Marta is all about. And as you just heard in that um, uh, the introduction, of the, the privilege I uh, have in, in TOE is to work very closely with leading major research infrastructures in computing data and networking across um, DOE and the Oak Ridge and Argonne Leadership Computing Facilities, which are famous for their large, extraordinarily large scale supercomputing systems now reaching that big, uh, reached the exascale uh, level of performance. Uh, but the NERSC user facility at Berkeley, which just now has passed 10,000 annual users, and the ESNet network, one of only two continental scale high performance networks uh, in, in the US. Uh, and as I'll get to uh, a new facility that's not yet on this slide. So infrastructure is people. I know that is a bit of a bumper sticker and a bit of cliche, but we uh, tend to celebrate the big shiny objects and pictures of supercomputers and the like. But at the end of the day, the thing that I've uh, learned in my 15 years here in DOE is that really the, the, the sole purpose of this major research infrastructure is to provide incredible tools to the open community and to be the human bridge between the advancement at the bleeding edge of that technology and the users driving that, but also users who may be worried about, man, should I go into this crazy larger scale environment, this higher performing environment? And that's a theme of these brief remarks. So a path that we've been on the last several years in DOE and with this privilege of um, the number of the drivers for these, this creating and continuing to renew this large scale research infrastructure and computing data and networking in DOE, we have these large scale drivers and, and that's what pushes us forward. And COVID, DOE's response to COVID, I'm sure every agency has celebrated stories of how they were um, tasked and met certain challenges in their in their mission remit in the COVID era. For DOE, when uh, you know it was time to sort of throw the kitchen sink from an R&D perspective at COVID, this object called the National Virtual Biotechnology Laboratory was really the the cardinal response. So really what this was about was the message from DOE headquarters to the national lab system, bring it all, bring it now, do whatever you can to bridge across institutional boundaries to provide researchers the facility, the the, the, the ability to, to do the research they need to do at the pace they need to do it. And this red cover here on the right is a report you can download. I can, I can provide the link to the organizers if you're interested. Amazing successes, and for, for example, in terms of rapid stand-up of research workflows using the X-ray light sources that DOE is famous for, and to do rapid turnaround of the data coming off end stations at the Linac coherent light source at SLAC, over to NERSC up across the bay at Berkeley Lab, um, to turn kind of accelerate the wall clock time for researchers to get insight from this real-time data. But buried in the report, too, are stories of deep frustration about the inability to get data from point A to point B or for frustration about, you know, how do we meld, uh, you know, data at rest in different locations to do novel analyses. So this vision of the integrated research infrastructure is, is long and in, in, in its germination, it, you know, it's what's old as new again, right? I, I often cite that the dawn of our large scale network, ESNet, was back in the 80s when it started with just researchers wanting access to the supercomputer way over yonder. Well, today this is all about just, we have we are blessed in, in, in the United States to have 
the envy of the world, many uh, research infrastructures of varying kinds were generally well resourced to build and continue to renew these. But AI is driving us here. But I'd say even more fundamentally, leading edge innovators, science um, is pushing us to intercompose these research infrastructures in holistic ways. And, and in terms of the computing, uh, computer science, realm, often this is tagged like a workflows, that's a term of art that's often cast about as advanced workflows, or how do you make these workflows performant? So this complicated slide, what is it really talking about? It's talking about make all this stuff work for people. It's about empowering researchers and it's about their data. And the things that I find um, really inspiring about MARTA is uh, not only um, your, your passion for your science, of course, that's self-evident, but the concerted steps that you've taken from the bottoms up to coalesce around a vision for, again, to be sort of bumper stickerish about it, a better tomorrow. And I think at the heart of this, and I'll come back to this at the end, is of course, as scientists, we acknowledge at, from the start that the relationship of a researcher or, or a collaboration to their data is sacrosanct. It is your lifeblood, right? So one of the approaches in this, this, um, this new um, step forward that DOE is taking is yes, we have a long history of building large scale research infrastructure. I'm about to describe a couple of formal steps we're taking to meld these things together, but it starts with an acknowledgement that we're talking about data and we're talking about workflows. If you're not offering a clear value proposition to individuals, to collaborators, there's no point in offering it, right? Because you, you're talking about potentially people making choices in how they do their science. So this IRI, it really has a double entendre. It's both about, in the first instance, integrating complex research infrastructure. That's challenging because we're talking about crossing institutional boundaries, true partnerships. Partnerships to be durable have to be founded on not only mutual respect, but mutual acknowledgement of what's in it for me. And then the second piece is the integrated research infrastructure. That means the, in the era of integrated science, you need specialized infrastructure to tend to those integrated models and modalities. And that's also a challenging design question. So you'll have access to these slides for later, and I want to accelerate my pace to get um, get off the stage and get to the other uh, intros to this panel discussion, and we can we can jump into it in the best Marta annual meeting spirit is a, a freewheeling conversation. But this slide is essentially was we on the funder side when we sat down across the office of science, which has a wide spectrum of of, of sciences and domains. Of course, I'm sure you're, you work a lot with the basic energy sciences program, but maybe other parts of DOE, and of course, beyond that, even other agencies. Uh, these are some of the value propositions that really are, what is this about? When we talk about integration, the hardest thing to partner in durable ways. And for communities, I like to focus your attention on, um, you know, certainly time to insight, right? There's really no point in doing this, this work unless you're going to accelerate that wall clock time for researchers or completely transform an opportunity to do research. And then for funders, there's a whole host of things about gaining traction with maybe Domains of science you don't typically work with, but who have the same challenges or similar challenges at least in that inform investments in data computing and networking infrastructure. So as I alluded to, we've been on a multi-year journey and it's just coincidental that this was during the pandemic. And really this has been about a concerted effort over years, building something from the inside out, meaning from the, um, we started with conversations within the Oscar facilities enterprise or we aligned around this vision, graduated to a larger conversation in the middle here uh, about uh, across the office of science with our domain program partners in the national laboratories of again, building an intellectual framework to tackle this problem. And I'll get to that in a moment. And now we're taking that step in the last few months to, to formalize this and instantiate it in, in real programs. So in the next slide, I'm going to have a QR code to this report. And I'm not going to read this slide, but three years ago when we started this vision and strategy and this journey to implementation, we didn't have an intellectual framework to break down the challenge of integration. Yes, there's been amazing uh, research projects over the years for decades, honestly, on workflows, middleware, how do you make things performant end to end? And we have not had any cogent way of really breaking down the science drivers that push this forward. And so this, uh, this workshop that, or rather this um, activity that we sculpted in 2022, that we call a blueprint activity, was really about melding the science drivers to the design thinking that would inform an IRI program. And so here's that QR code I promised. This uh, 
this integrated research infrastructure blueprint activity really pointed the way for us as DOE Office of Science to take a concerted step in formalizing this as uh, a program with no new money yet. I'll get to that in a moment. Fundamentally about bringing existing pieces together. So these four elements are how we're beginning this program. It's a live and breathe in this the last few weeks, we're standing it up and, and we have an FY24, 25 agency priority goal to make this a reality. And there's four key elements. One is that we have a way with that framework I just alluded to on the previous slide of actually understanding requirements for this integrated science, this IRI, and wiring those into our major infrastructure investments, whether this, that's the next, the next NERSC supercomputer, whether that's upgrades to our network or the high performance data facility project. New rule number one represents that we now have a framework to build upon, to lay down requirements from different domains and different sciences and fuse that into our major research infrastructure projects. Number two and number three are totally intertwined, but they're about having a formal governance structure that where the community can self-organize, where uh, individuals can seek out leadership positions and a structured set of activities that have a, a technical roadmap to them. And that we, I would, you know, I draw a lot of inspiration from, frankly, um, all different directions in this. Um, large physics collaborations are some, uh, but there are many large collaborations um, that are self-organized by the scientific community that have inspired our thinking about how to do the governance right. And that's really, as I said, number two and number three are intertwined because we need to bring projects into formal coordination. Previous to now, that has not been a thing that people have just been running forward in loose collaboration, maybe touching base at conferences and the like or through programs, but this is of a whole other caliber. Uh, in terms of scale. And the fourth is to deploy a test, a fat finding test bed, meaning a test and development environment where researchers can propose ideas, try things and, and fail fast in a way that mimics production environments and allows you to de-risk technology design patterns without disturbing today's production environments. I'm gonna fast forward through this. I allude to this new high performance data facility and we can get more into that if you're curious to, to, just, uh, to get into that during the discussion. But essentially we have in our FY24 budget request, a um, big leap forward in funding uh, the early stages of a new project that will create uh, a large-scale data infrastructure for the DOE. And as I alluded to, it's part of a family of major projects in the uh, DOE uh, Advanced Scientific Community Research Portfolio. And here's another report cover I allude to is we've exercised that, that framework again to understand the design patterns that we need to build. This is my last slide, it's a conversation starter. I know it's really wordy, let me take a step back and just say it's a privilege to be here. I look forward to the conversation. I think that's been on um, I would encounter a lot in this white, I heard of last summer is the white hot AI summer when in the spring when chat GTPT erupted and across the government, everyone's hair is on fire for like, oh my gosh, we got to do stuff on AI. People asking questions about AI. AI and data are completely intertwined. But I think those who've been in this space for a long time know that, yeah, okay, AI is the hot thing. And even AI has been around for a long time and AI gets confused with ML. Data is the jet fuel for all this, right? And, and as I alluded to before, data is the intellectual currency of science. It, it, it's, it's, inextric it's, it's bound up in, in individuals' careers, right? It's your data. <laughs> you, you, you have the employed equity of reading the data. So when we talk in the, on the funder side about, well, what do we need for data infrastructure? There's this huge question I think a lot of us are wrestling with is, under what conditions should stewardship of data be separate from the programmatics and funding of the stewardship of data infrastructure? And in DOE, we've achieved, we've kind of reached this point in the conversation of, you know, at least for, in the program I'm, I'm privileged to lead, we see many different domains of science needing that higher level performance for data infrastructure, workflow performance. And when we see that from our from our mission, we know we're onto something that we should be investing in common infrastructure that's available to many domains. I also have seen for a long time that large scale research infrastructure has an inherent convening power that uh, that has an amazing unintended positive benefits of different domains sort of rubbing shoulders with each other and gaining inspiration from their approaches to solving problems. So this is my my closing. I hope I'm not too far over time. Uh, is just to kind of as a conversation starter. I'm really intrigued by this question. I look forward to exploring it and listening today uh, from the standpoint of how does this look from a really mature and growing materials uh, science 
data community, where you've taken so many steps in recent years to come together as a, as a, as a community to challenge us, maybe on the infrastructure provider side, to level up our game and provide a higher level of performance in certain aspects or new infrastructure that you can productively use for your science. I'll stop share and I'll pass the microphone. Thank you so very much. Um, that's given us so much to think about and excellent seed questions. Um, next up, we have Arthi. So I'm gonna let her start to uh, share her screen. Um, while I do the interactions. Professor Arthi J. Raman is a professor in the material in the departments of chemical and biomolecular engineering and material science and engineering at the University of Delaware. And she is also the director for an NSF funded NRT graduate traineeship program on computing and data science for training for materials innovation, discovery, and analytics. She currently serves as an associate editor for Macromolecules and for the last three years also served as the inaugural deputy editor for ACS Polymers Gold. She has received numerous awards, including most recently one for excellence in teaching. She received her doctorate in chemical engineering from North Carolina State University, and her research expertise is in the development and application of computational techniques to study polymer, nanocomposites, blends, and solutions and biomaterials. And with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to her to provide some excellent thoughts on this topic. Great, thank you so much, David and Debbie for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here and um, uh, just share some of my experiences and, and some thoughts inspired by that in the context of the research we do in my lab, in the context of the graduate traineeship and educational needs that I've heard from uh, non-academic uh, um, employers, as well as my role um, uh, in publishing. Um, so today you'll hear essentially literally snippets from that, and then I'll give those uh, few thoughts that I think can be part of working group uh, discussion later on. Um, so let me start with the research. Um, I know there are three of us in the panel, and I, I, I believe I know a little bit about their backgrounds. Um, and so my background is in the area of soft materials. I know here we are talking about materials in general. Uh, and so my lab works with polymers, colloids, biomaterials. Uh, here are just a few examples of the types of materials we work with. We work with polymer composites, associating polymers, charged polymers, uh, new polymers that we are essentially testing out for replacing uh, unsustainable commodity polymers in the long run and biopolymers. Um, in all of these examples that I'm giving you, my main goal today is to highlight that all we do is connect molecular design to structure of these materials to properties. So that's the type of data we generate in my group with computations as I'll show in the next slide and our collaborators are generating in their experiments. Um, and something that becomes very important for me to highlight, let me actually get my laser pointer so I can show that is that quality or the type, the features, aspects of the data in soft materials is different than the data you may have seen in protein data banks, nucleic acid data banks, hard materials, because in most of these other cases, there is some level of precision in the structures these materials occupy or, 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 or adopt. And um, in soft materials, everything's dispersed, everything's a distribution. Furthermore, uh, the data that you generate depends on how you process the material, which is not often the case. It can still be the case in some of these other systems, but that processing becomes a big part. So data is not just about what you generated. Here, there's really a context and there's a, 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 a the whole distribution of the measurements have to be part of the data. So that's one thing I wanted to highlight. The next thing I'm going to highlight is the tools that we work with in my lab and what we need in terms of researchers ourselves. Um, so my the bread and butter in my lab is the first three uh, bullets here, molecular modeling simulations theory, but I'm gonna highlight a little bit more the area that is more aligned with the discussions today. So of course the types of data we generate come from these top uh, uh, three um, tools, but uh, our focus in the last seven to eight years has been uh, towards using machine learning um, based workflows or methods to connect better with our experimentalist collaborators so we can then compare our results to them. So in that process, what has happened is our machine learning workflows are really uh, requiring data from our experimental collaborators. So in the next slide, I'll highlight just two such methods and how much we need um, 
easy access to their data for developing methods that help analyze small angle scattering, connect small angle scattering with microscopy. Uh, we can, of course, generate in silico data, but the reality is there are unique aspects in the measurements that we need them to share with us. So we really are very much invested in making sure we can teach them how to share data with us, but that's only in these little collaborations. I'm also, a big, as many of you are, a big proponent for sharing code. Uh, and so we do that in our GitHub page. So that's my research need. So you'll understand where my points will come uh, in the next slide. But I also, as Debbie said, I run a graduate traineeship program. I know Catherine here also runs another NRT like this. And here the focus for us is really combining computing data science with materials. Of course, my expertise in soft materials, so it's that. But one of the thing, things we teach students which we realize they don't get exposure to when they get taught in their own silos of chemistry and computer science or experiments and simulations is they have to understand that when they do experiments, they have to produce data and share it with their uh, computation collaborators. So that's something that we actually teach the students to do and they ha don't have that background coming in. So this is gonna be a second point that will motivate what I'll share. So the four things that I wanna share uh, that maybe you will consider in your um, working group uh, decisions or discussion making um, are these. First is, uh, this stems a little bit from the expertise I've gained from publications uh, and, and from being involved myself in the editorial role is that there is a need for researchers to understand what open access means in addition to open source codes being provided along with that. Open access publications give a great amount of power to the reader to understand the context of the data that they may be sharing without being you know, buried under fees and, and um, needing uh, subscriptions. So this is something I'm a big proponent of, but I also understand that the entire world doesn't think of open access in the same way. We in the US, I often hear people say, well, I don't have the money to pay for open access fees. Nobody's giving me that. So for those of you here from DOE and NSF, this might be something for you to consider where you essentially provide a small pot of money that can only be used for open access publication. That's no one else can say, well, I could have hired an undergrad for that. If that happens, everyone will share open access publications. Naturally, then the understandability of data will be there. Don't worry, Debbie, I'm almost done. I have just two more points. Um, I think this is obvious from my education standpoint that I do care about teaching the younger generation, but this is not gonna happen in such data science focused or computer science focused meetings. Such teaching has to happen in subject matter conferences where students come to take workshops I got exposed to machine learning myself in Debbie's workshop at APS. So that can have a very long-term effect. And so that's something I will ask that you consider. Very last, this is a very personal note. Uh, when we get data from our collaborators who use very sophisticated instrumentation, their software is also proprietary. And so when they share their data, we can't open it because we don't have the instruments. So let's have anyone who's here from instrumentation companies to start to make software that's open for everyone to access. It'll only make your instrument sales better because everyone will be able to access data. Thank you. Thank you so much for that and for the very clear points that we'll be able to discuss more later. Um, next up, uh, we have um, Professor Alejandro Strachan, if you could share your slides and while I introduce you. Alejandro Strachan is a professor of material engineering at Purdue University and deputy director of NSF's NanoHub. Before joining Purdue, he was a staff member in the theoretical division of Los Alamos National Laboratory. His scholarly work includes cyber infrastructure to maximize the impact and impact of and democratize access to the models and data for research and education. He currently serves on the governing council for MARTA. Additionally, he has received numerous awards, including R&D 100 award in the category of software and services for NanoHub. He received his doctorate in physics from the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. His research focuses on the development of predictive atomistic and multi-scale models to describe materials from first principles and their combination with data science to address problems of technological or scientific importance, such as high energy density and active materials, as well as others. And with that, I will let him take it away. 
Uh, thank you, Devi. Uh, I hope you can all uh, hear me okay and can see my slides. Yes. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, support what, what Marta has been doing, which is a terrific mission. So I'd like to uh, introduce you the open resources that we have available on Nano Hub to make data and workflows fair and uh, pervasive. So let me jump to it, if I could advance my slides. Um, I, I know I'm maybe preaching to the choir here, but uh, we have a data problem. And yeah, the data that we generate at uh, quite a bit of cost, either computational or experimental, ends up languishing in local resources. Uh, when we publish, the data that we publish is biased. We tend to not share uh, negative results. And that obviously has a lot of implications in machine learning. And the subset of the data that's published is really not machine learning ready. Uh, so we need to change how we do things. And I hope everyone here uh, agrees with that. I think something that maybe is not is less understood is that uh, when we think about fair data, we should also include the data workflows, uh, the workflows that we use to generate data, to analyze experiments or to run uh, simulations, which are quite complex, and uh, they're not always, uh, uh, almost never shared. Um, and so in NanoHub, what we uh, allow researchers to do is to actually publish their workflows, end-to-end -end workflows, with uh, formally declared inputs and outputs. And um, I'll give you some examples, but these workflows could be any sort of data analysis, or running an HPC simulation uh, in an external resource. Uh, one of the cool things is that developers, when they publish one of these workflows on NanoHub, it's an actual publication. So NanoHub is a publisher of simulation tools. You get an e DOI and they're indexed by Web of Science. But also these formally declared inputs and outputs, the services and the requirements for the workflows discoverable. Uh, so you can query and ask, okay, do you have a tool that does X or Y? Um, these, uh, these published workflows can be consumed as a service in a variety of ways, uh, including, uh, for example, from a machine learning autonomous research workflow that uh, requests information as it uh, needs it. And uh, this is an example from my group. We're a computational group. And an undergrad student, David Farace, uh, consumed one of these uh, FAIR workflows, co consumed information from one of those FAIR workflows that were developed over years by PhD-level students from a, an AI workflow. Now, so that's the, that's the workflow itself being fair and discoverable and, and reusable. They're all containerized, so they always run this way. Uh, every, every time anyone runs one of these published uh, workflows, we call them SIM tools on NanoHub, every, every single run of inputs and the outputs are stored in a database. They're indexed and stored in a database that we call the results database. So by the time David finished the paper, all the data was already uh, indexed, available on a database and ML ready for anyone to use. And uh, you can do whatever you want with that data. This is an example of a data exploration tool that allows people to see uh, the 400 or so simulations that David performed for his paper. Again, all of this is done automatically by the infrastructure. Um, this is an example of a workflow that launches a molecular dynamics uh, simulation, which is the type of research that we do in my group. But uh, researchers can develop any uh, workflow uh, on any uh, topic, and we'll, I'll show you an example in a minute. Uh, this is a view uh, the, of the results database uh, from our web interface. You can access the data through an API or through the web interface, and it includes uh, a DOI for each table associated with each of the tools, a unique identifier for each entry. And we also expose 
the schema for the data and of course the data itself. Currently we have a little over 1.8 million entries on the results database. And these are simulations that are, are performed by users from all over the world running tools on NanoHub. Um, as I, I mentioned, an example of a workflow for uh, that runs molecular dynamics, but this is not just for computational geeks. Uh, we have workflows that ingest raw experimental data and analyzes the data. So this is an example of taking data from oxidation studies and then uh, analyzing, calibrating 42 possible models based on the data and performing model selection. So you basically drop your experimental data and the workflow analyzes it and gives you back a report. And both the raw data and the post-process data are automatically made available. Um, guess what? You know, as a community, the, uh, we are not always super consistent at analyzing our data, right? So what we found is that uh, different groups analyze data very differently. And I'll finish with, with this thought that if we lower the barriers to access uh, to simulation tools, to data resources, you can we can actually have a, make an impact on how people work. Um, on the left, you see uh, nano have usage over a year, both in terms of running simulations and resources. But on the right, you see a table of the U.S. educational institutions ranked by the number of simulation users on NanoHub. It's not surprising that Purdue is the largest, but you see that we've served thousands of simulations from the majority of the, actually all, uh, the top 500 engineering schools. But what I'm most proud of is the fact that um, we, we have Northwestern and MIT and Harvard and Stanford but we also have Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, Ball State, that's an R2 university from Muncie, Indiana, a UTEP, that's a minority serving institution, and uh, Chicago State University, that's a, an HBCU. Um, so I, I think we can make a difference in, in changing how the community work and educating our students. Um, and with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It was exciting hearing about NanoHub. Um, first, before I get to our last um, panelist, I first want to remind you that there is a link in the chat um, for a Google Doc and feel free to put your questions in the Q&A because we are almost there and ready to ask everyone their questions. So please start filling those in. And now um, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. James Warren, if he could please start sharing his slide uh, while I slides while I introduce him. Introduce him. Dr. James Warren is the director of the Materials Genome Program at NIST. He was part of the ad hoc committee within the Office of Science and Technology Policy's National Science and Technology Council that crafted the founding white paper on the administration's Materials Genome Initiative. Since 2012, Dr. Warren has served as the Executive Secretary of the NSTC MGI Subcommittee, coordinating interagency efforts to achieve the goals laid out in the MGI. He received his doctorate in theoretical physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara. His research has been broadly concerned with developing both models of materials phenomena and the tools to enable the solution of those models. Specific foci include solidification, pattern formation, and green structures and metal, among many other things. Um, and with that, I will let him take it away. All right, can you hear me? Please, someone wave yes. or something. Yes. I once gave an entire talk and then there was a phone call. Anyway, uh, yeah. I was talking to myself. <laughs> so I don't want that to happen again. All right, so yeah, I got five minutes. I'm gonna try to keep this as clean and short as I can. Um, hopefully I won't go too far over. I remember putting this into an MGI presentation back in 2013. I'll get to this, but you know, data-driven science, that's a lot of uh, what we're into. This, this book, I think, is 2007, so it's something to keep in mind. We're getting on almost 20 years uh, since it came out. Um, right, so the way I tend to think about the MGI whenever I talk it up, and I'm not going to get into too much detail here in five minutes, but of course is that we are trying to develop systems 
that create and capture knowledge and material. And of course, that can be any digital information uh, that we have, preferably. Of course, that means the data and uh, you know code and any of these other things that would be within the remit of the MARTA. Um, so we can accelerate the prediction uh, systems that we want so that we can accelerate the design and discovery of new materials, and deploy them to manufacturing. So, you know, as I was saying, NIST really has had to formulate its own response to the Materials Genome Initiative. And we really decided to take this notion of multi-scale modeling and uh, sort of frame it around three basic ideas, enabling and enhancing the exchange of data, um, which is a lot of what the monitor is talking about. And then how do we assess the quality of that information? And then the third thing we had was new methods in metrology, which included this notion of data-driven analysis and models. And if you had asked me back then when you know, real data-driven materials was going to get going, let alone AI, I would have been cagey in my response. Uh, the fact that within a few years, we were seeing the application of machine learning writ broadly uh, to these systems was a bit of luck on our part, as as well as, you know, maybe we'll give ourselves a little credit. Um, so uh, it's been quite a, quite a, uh, quite a thing to see. Um, just to talk a little bit about the new MGI strategic plan, of course, one of the main line elements in that plan was the establishment of what we call the National Materials Data Network, of which the MARTA and the Martian uh, efforts really are exemplars of. And so it's really great to, to see this uh, community getting together to really drive the conversation and demand uh, that the uh, patrons of uh, materials R&D really focus uh, on this infrastructural element. Um, you know, as we've been talking about, AI and machine, and machine learning in general have really made my job a lot easier because everybody is now talking about this. Uh, and, and so it becomes this, you know, a very powerful way of generating new models um, with certain caveats. Uh, and so, you know, so that's been pretty exciting. Now, I just have a few other comments. You know, I if I had a longer time to rant, I would go on, but since we're gonna have a panel discussion after this um, around, you know, the various things that uh, are exhausting. Of course, a lot of what we're talking about is publishing, mostly data, of course, but, uh, you know, it applies to academic publications as well. And, uh, you know, papers really aren't necessarily the best way to transmit information. I think we probably agree on that. Um, and uh, anybody who has been on the internet in the last 30 years has noticed that it doesn't cost very much actually to publish, right? At least in away from academia. And this includes data, right? You can just put it out there. It's not hard, right? So that the problem isn't money, right? The, the problems lie elsewhere. And so I'm not going to go through this whole slide and castigate everyone because I know that some of these things are, the incentives are in the wrong places. But I do want to emphasize one point here today because I think it has particular salience which is, I think that the community in general, and this is the red one here, right? Refusal to share data should be viewed as evidence of fraud at this point. And I used to say this to be provocative. I don't think so anymore. I just, I think we should just be done, okay? Nobody should be, and you know, unless of course there's some, uh, you know, uh, security reason or uh, some obviously private information that can't be shared. But in general, and basically in the spaces we operate in, it's pretty rare. And so we, I think as for those of you who are involved in the publication business, as it were, so that means reviewers, editors, submitters, you know, you have an opportunity to sort of make a difference here. Um, I will reiterate this. I've said this at other MARTA meetings. So I'm going to say it again, <laughs> right? So this is the incentive problem. Until people can do science and engineering on the platforms that we're trying to build, all we're doing is talking about what would be nice. Right, we need to align incentives with what we're building, which means we need to get people's self-interest out in front. Uh, you know, so it's nice to see uh, some of what we heard from the other panelists uh, this morning, right? So you need to be able to combine data sets, build on prior work, visualize results, discover interrelationships, do AI and machine learning, find new collaborators. Um, basically, people want fame or they want money if they're a company. And this is the way uh, that you get it. So trying to make that happen. Um, and so we said, right, so of course, some people really, of course, love doing science, but I think that uh, uh, everything that you could do with these capabilities would get you the, the joy of exploration. So, um, you know, another way to sort of think about this is 
all of our research outputs should be machine actionable. And to the extent that they aren't machine actionable, they're stuck, right? They're stuck in this space that they can't. So we should try to think about everything in that, in that way. And so with that, I'll just throw out one more thing. So I have colleagues at NIST that are working on what they're calling the research data framework, which sort of walks through a lot of the sort of nitty gritty of the issues around what you do with research data. So if you're looking for some formal structure uh, to think about these problems, that might be something that's of use. And if anybody wants uh, that link, because it's a little, either take a picture of it or, or send me an email and I'll, I'll get it to you. All right, so with that, I will cede the, the rest of the time back and uh, hopefully we can have a nice chat.